Hey everybody, welcome to the first lesson in week nine, where as part of your biopsychology topic, we'll take a look at the different ways of studying the brain. So we'll first off start with a specification glance and see what you have to know. We'll take a look at the EEG, electroencephalogram and postmortem methods. And we'll look at all the key terminology that you'll have to use when you evaluate these as well. So what do you need to know? Well, when it refers to ways of studying the brain on your specification, what we're talking about specifically are the different methods that investigators will use to study and learn about the brain. So scanning techniques such as fMRI scans, electroencephalogram to look at brain waves, event related potentials and post-mortem examination. So it's a very large topic in biopsychology, but it is one that will give you some good links to other parts of biopsychology as well. In this session, the two that we're going to focus on are EEGs and postmortems. So what do you know already about EEGs and postmortems? Think about where you may have referred to these throughout other topics in psychology. Pause the video for five minutes while you write down what you know already. And if you're not sure, then you could always take a quick glance at all of your available resources. Let's start with electroencephalograms which are referred to as EEGs. And these are ways to measure the electrical activity in the brain. So we know there's lots of different types of brain waves in the brain, and these are measured through electrodes, which will be placed on the scalp or the temples of the head. And you'll find these used quite a lot in sleep research, as you'll come to look at when you do things like circadian rhythms and ultradian rhythms as well. Then we have postmortems, and this involves dissecting a deceased brain. So there's our sample that we would use in a lot of research, and it involves a close look at the anatomical structure of the brain. So we can get really into the deeper parts of the brain, those parts that we're not always able to investigate as part of a scan or with electrodes. And you'll find these used a lot in schizophrenia research, especially when looking at things like neurons, synaptic transmissions and receptor sites. So let's take a little closer look at EEGs. So we can see on the diagram that someone here is wearing a, a almost like a hat, but actually it's a device covered in electrodes that attach themselves to the scalp. And these electrodes are used to measure any electrical activity coming from the brain. And by that, we mean the different brain waves. Now, what these electrodes do is pick up any signals of neurons firing together, and it gives us a visual output of what's perhaps happening in the brain with these different brain waves. And the output's recorded on a graph. EEGs, as we mentioned before, they use a lot in sleep research. And based on sleep research, we found lots of different brain waves. And you can see this on the diagram on the screen. We've got beta waves at the top of the diagram, and that's measured by lots of activity, short bursts of activity in the brain waves. Alpha waves, theta waves, and then more associated with uh, slow wave sleep, we've got delta waves. Now, recordings of an EEG can determine amplitude, so there's a key term. And by amplitude, we mean the intensity of the wave. But the EEGs also measure frequency, and by that we mean the speed, or how many brain waves are showing themselves. If the waves are synchronised, what we mean is that we can see a quite clear pattern. For example, we can see a, cl a clear pattern forming with the beta waves and the alpha waves, but once we get further down, we start to have no pattern. And this is what we refer to as desynchronised waves. So for your exam, when talking about EEGs, do make the distinction between synchronized and desynchronized. Also make the distinction between amplitude of waves and frequency of waves, and perhaps use one or two examples of specific brain waves to aid your AO1. Let's have a thinking activity now. Use your knowledge of psychology so far and your available resources to identify where the use of EEGs have been or maybe could be useful for helping us understand human behaviour. So use your resources and pause the video for 10 minutes while you have a good investigation. This is going to be useful for any question on EEGs, but also any question on how something like the biological approach has helped the economy.
Here's some suggested answers. Don't worry if you came up with other things. EEGs are used a lot. We can use EEGs, especially when looking at sleep disorders. So if somebody's showing an atypical sleep pattern, and this can include things like narcolepsy, dream terrors, insomnia, uh, lots of sleep disorders. EEG is a helpful way of looking at what's actually going on in the brain when someone is struggling. Same with ADHD. Uh, epilepsy can tell us what's happening in the brain at the moment when someone is struggling or showing symptoms. So lots of different uses of EEGs. So what about postmortems? Well, postmortems are an examination that take place after the death of a person. Uh, postmortems can happen on the body, but we're interested in the examination of the brain. Now, of course, the problems with mind and behaviour often are to do with something biological in origin, and it may manifest itself as cognitive faults, maybe delusions, irrational thinking. And one of the things that we can do in postmortems is really get down to the minutiae of the brain. Parts of the brain that aren't accessible with scans and EEGs and so on. And it involves dissecting the brain and isolating different regions of the brain to see whether they were indeed implicated in death, implicated in conditions that the patient might have lived with, or perhaps they'll just show some structural abnormalities that will pique our interest about what might cause certain conditions. One of the things you'll come across when you study biopsychology is that there's language centres found within different regions of the brain. And one of those examples can be used here to further exemplify how postmortems have been significant. So Paul Brocker found that with patients, his patients who struggled with speech production had a brain lesion on the part of the brain that was responsible, or so he believed, for language. In other words, if his patients struggled with speech production, and all of his patients had a lesion in this part of the brain, like you can see on the diagram, then the conclusion drawn was that this part of the brain must be for language production. And that's in the left hemisphere in the frontal lobe. The inability to produce speech was then termed Broca's aphasia. So we can see there how postmortems have been really useful, because without postmortems and the ability to really look at the intricacies of the brain structure, we would never have found these language senses. Let's think about our IO3 skills. Now, when evaluating methods of research in the brain, the following points are a good place to start. Temporal resolution, spatial resolution, invasiveness, implications. There are many more things, but we'll focus on these four for now. So use your knowledge or resources to find out what they mean and what they refer to. So pause the video for 10 minutes, see if you can find the definition of each of these terms and how they would relate to the different ways of measuring the brain. Well, here's some suggested answers. So temporal resolution is the ability to see the brain responding in real time and without delay. So if we've got something that provides us with maybe a four second delay between, let's say, take a scan and get the image, then that's something that we might say has got poor temporal resolution. Spatial resolution is the ability to investigate specific and isolated parts of the brain. Invasiveness, whether the technique causes harm or discomfort and implications whether the technique has been used to help us understand or even treat human conditions, psychological or physiological. So well done if you were able to find any of those. Let's take that one step further. So we've been focusing on EEGs and postmortems. So assess the use of EEGs and postmortems for each of the below factors. Thinking about those four things that you've just read about, Pause the video for 10 minutes and see if you can comment on each of the four factors for each of the methods of studying the brain. Hopefully you found some answers. Here's some that you can compare your own to. And we'll run through them one by one. Temporal validity. Well, EEGs are good because brain responses can be seen in real time without any real delay. So if somebody is thinking of something or if they're dreaming, then we can see the output on the machines and the graph immediately. Unfortunately, though, 
in postmortems, the brain isn't actually functioning, so we've got no temporal validity to speak of. Spatial validity, in EEGs, this is quite poor, even though it doesn't give us any big delay, and we've got good temporal validity, the only thing we get from an EEG is general function about the brain. We don't get to measure specifics. We don't get to measure what part of the brain a brainwave is originating from. For that, we need to look at something different, like an ERP. For postmortems, on the other hand, spatial validity is really good. And of course, it's probably the only method where we can get to that minutia of the brain. EEGs and postmortems are not considered invasive. Uh, of course, the, we've got a deceased sample for postmortems. So there are some ethics that you could talk about, but overall, it's not invasive. And EEGs, slightly uncomfortable maybe with the electrodes uh, hat on the scalp, but not too bad. And the implications are good from both. We've got implications for sleep research and sleep disorders, like we mentioned earlier. The language centres of the brain from EEG research. Postmortems have also helped us learn language centres, but they've also helped us understand conditions like schizophrenia, amnesia, and also the parts of the brain that may be responsible for our gender identity. In terms of general evaluation points, EEGs are sometimes favoured because they are more cost effective than a big fMRI scan. And postmortems, unfortunately, don't let us establish cause and effect. And we call this bidirectional. So it may be that a change in the brain has caused somebody to have a condition, and that's my, that might be what we find in the postmortem. But it's also likely that the condition may have affected the brain, and that might be what we see in the postmortem instead. And we just don't know which is the truest statement. The other thing to consider about postmortems is that even if it does lead to great implications, unfortunately, it's not going to help the patient. It's not going to help the person that you do the postmortem on. So lots of things to consider in terms of our AO3 skills.